Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the All Things Interesting Podcast, where as you know, it is my goal to bring to you the unique and interesting stories of guests from a wide variety of backgrounds. Now, on today's episode, I sit down and talk with a well-renowned astrologer by the name of Frederick Woodruff. Now, Frederick has been an astrologer for the better part of 40 years, and he is the author of Secrets of a Telephone Psychic and Skywriter, Notes on Modern Astrology. He has a loyal clientele. His clientele include artists, politicians, film and music stars, doctors, housewives, and individuals from a wide spectrum of backgrounds, as you can imagine. Now, we had a very unique conversation that focused on the cultural, societal, and individual aspects related to astrology and I believe a lot of people will find it to be very interesting with the eccentric and quirky if you will moments during the show. Now before we get started if you enjoyed the episode or if you enjoyed the show please make sure to subscribe to the All Things Interesting podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, or your favorite podcast platform. And as always, feel free to follow me on Twitter, at Tesher Cohen, and on Instagram or Facebook, at the All Things Interesting podcast. So, without further ado, please welcome my guest, Frederick Woodruff. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the All Things Interesting Podcast. With me today is Frederick Woodruff. How are you, Frederick? I'm doing great, Tesher, and thank you for having me on. I am a fan of your podcast. I, I, I love the tone and just general vibe of it. I, I'm a late night listener, so I like the tone. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And again, it's great to have you on the show today. Yeah, I'm excited. I think this is going to be a good uh, dialogue. Yeah. Before we get started, um, can you talk a bit about your background and what it is that you do as an astrologer? In a nutshell, I've been practicing uh, as a consulting astrologer for about 45 years now. And I work uh, or telecommute from my home on Vashon Island in Puget Sound. I'm an island uh, creature. And... Um, yeah, I had teachers back in the 70s that were actually really well-renowned astrologers. I don't know how well-renowned I am, but thank you for that. But yeah, I had teachers uh, when I was a teenager and then a lot of self-taught uh, work and just then a lot of sessions with clients, which um, I think makes me a formidable astrologer because I have that under my belt. And before the show, we were kind of just talking about some of your experiences and you mentioned that you were in town for an astrology conference. What was that about? Well, I'd gone over with my friend Kate and she had sort of got me pulled into a type of astrology that is more, well, Hellenistic based. And without going on and on about that, it, it's just more traditional astrology that uses a very... Uh, strict rules and laws when you're reading somebody's horoscope. 
So mm-hmm. I was curious about that style because mine is more of a psychological orientation to the horoscope. And um, yeah, so they had that conference going out there. So I went and attended that and had a great time. Mm-hmm. And you've, you're, you've been a astrologer for around 45 years now. What's, what's the story behind that? Well, when I was about 13, I remember waking up, literally woke up one day and I just felt out of sorts about living and life. I mean, beyond like teenage angst, it was more, you know, kind of looking at the world, my parents, school, and I just felt, God, there has got to be something more than this to life. I, I, it's hard to articulate, but that led me to studying metaphysics in general, you know, all, everything under that rubric, like the Tarot, dream work, astrology. And um, I decided at a young age that that's what I was going to do. Of course, my dad was horrified because <laughs> he wanted, you know, he had wanted an attorney or a doctor. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that was a that was a big a moment when you know I declared that to him. But what would you say kind of drew you to astrology specifically? Because that's just a very esoteric topic or career to kind of be pulled to at a young age. Just you, you mentioned that you kind of got drawn to the whole thing in your teenage years, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I wish you knew astrology because I could show you my chart <laughs> and you would be like, oh yeah, sun's in the 12th house, moon's in Scorpio, I get it. Um, I, you know, this sounds corny, but I was charmed at that age. There were these little tiny books that you used to get at the supermarket and they would be one for Aries, one for Taurus, one for Cancer. And I used to collect those like uh, baseball cards. And that idea of typologies uh, just really grabbed me. And I thought, wow, I, I want to learn, you know, I want to learn this. I want to understand this. And that's how I started. And also, I would add this crazy moment happened in the mid 70s that came out of the counterculture movement if you read about that because you and i have a pretty large age gap um but do you remember learning about that period in school when you were i don't know in civics or whatever they call it now just socio-cultural time like the mid 70s the hippie movement Um, you know they briefly touched upon that but usually when anybody thinks about the 70s they'll usually default to woodstock lsd uh freedom peace avoiding you know wars all that stuff so that's kind of what <laughs> that I sounds remember good it. to me it still sounds great yeah. i mean um yeah so well anyway where was i going with oh so at that time within the culture this uh, East meets West collision happened, meaning religions from the East, spiritual practices from the East, like Buddhism, Zen, and things like astrology, the Tarot, all of these had this renaissance in American culture, um, or not renaissance, they kind of made their first appearance in the culture. Mm-hmm. And so astrology was actually much more well this is weird it was very much like what's happening now with millennials and astrology which with the internet has become just mega so astrology is having a true renaissance in america now but at the time i was a kid it you know was quite unique and unusual but it was out in the culture you know, people, everybody knew their sun sign. The, this play mm-hmm. called Hair was like huge, which invoked a lot of astrology. Um, you know, there were posters and keychains. Everything to do with astrology was like a buzzing at that time. So that that 
it gave, gave me some uh, kind of foundation. How do you think astrology is kind of differing uh, from back in the day, like the 50s, 60s, 70s, as opposed well, to current it's day? it's in an awful position. I see the internet having a real a denigrating effect on astrology. Um, mm -hmm. It's great that it's put the word out more, but the quality of astrology and what would be criteria for being a good astrologer, all of that is uh, out of the mix now. You know how the internet is, anyone can publish anything or post anything. Or So um, I'm always fighting people about that. I've got sort of a, a reputation in the astrology community as being really curmudgeonly about the net and, mm -hmm. and big tech in general. I find it um, uh, boring, but you know, the whole culture is fascinated by it. So I have to work within those means too. There is a big fascination with astrology nowadays, but at the same time, it's an extremely contentious topic and it's either you're on the side that believes it or thinks that astrology is pseudoscience, for example. And I know back in, uh, I don't know, a couple de decades ago, Carl Sagan went out of his way to kind of dispute the reality of astrology. Mm. But I don't think anybody really understands what it is or what the basis is behind the topic. Can you kind of provide at le least your perspective? Well, yeah, well, sure. But what? let me just ask you, like what you're in that group I was talking about within with this renaissance that's up with millennials, especially there was a great New Yorker article. I think I sent you that last week to check out talking about this. I mean, what, how do you with your peers or now, or how do you view it at this time? It's a mixed bag. I mean, growing up at a younger age, I think at least for myself, and my peers, astrology used to be more commonly seen as okay well there could be some plausibility to it because there was like a level of confirmation bias of wow that sign has some characteristics with me so i may as well believe it and then i'll tend to follow or i'm saying i but i mean in general people tend to follow their daily uh, horoscopes or monthly or what have you mm -hmm. and it had some level of a cult following at the same time, like you said, with the access to more information on the internet, people are more likely to kind of attack it and find holes in astrology to kind of prove that it's wrong. Mm -hmm. So again, there are multiple camps to it. And I think people nowadays follow it more of an interesting thing. They don't go what they don't believe in it as heavily so it's like As a novelty the, that is fun to yeah, dabble it, it's, in, it's, you're saying. Exactly. It's more of a novelty more than anything. It's something mm -hmm. that's like interesting to look at, but it's not something that's heavily invested in compared to something like religion, for example. Thank but God. then again, both both have both have something such as confirmation bias. You know, you you believe in something because it kind of provides you that uh rigidity in your life. It kind of provides that uh, path for you to follow. So I guess there is that similar mm. or similarity between the two. So well, all right. So I, um, I think you know I'm going to reference a culture critic that I uh, respect a great deal and uh, read just about everything she's put out. This woman, Camille Paglia, she's a professor over on the East Coast, and uh, she made this statement about ast astrology that always, every, every time I read it, I'm reconnected to what it is about astrology that uh, holds my focus and attention. And I'm just going to read you this quote. It's not that long. She says, people who dismiss astrology do so out of either ignorance or rationalism. Rationalists have their place, but their limited assumptions and methods must be kept out of the arts. Interpretation of poem, dream, or person 
requires intuition and divination, not science. So she drops a lot of bombs there that I think, well, she's an Aries, so that's not surprising. But she stirs the pot up a lot because she pulls astrology immediately out of the camp where people are trying to scientifically, empirically prove its uh, effectiveness or, or workability, whatever you want to call it. And she puts it, as I see, in the correct category, which is art. But there is the idea that astrology is a mix of both art and science, because to understand the placement of the planets, there has to be some usage of mathematics. Well, sure. Astronomy, of course, started as astrology. I mean, astrology... As soon as human beings could like turn their heads like up to look at the sky, astrology started. So, but yes, astronomy, of course, astrologers work, yeah, with scientific data, the movement position of the planets, the movement of them through the solar system, etc. Yes, but that's pretty much it. It's just using, you know, books that list all these uh, tables of uh, data in there. Um, you know, there have been statistician type scientific studies, or I don't know, statistical studies, you know, that that's something that people throughout history have devoted a lot of their time and energy to. For me, I have no interest in any of that because first of all, I'm so busy using astrology. I and I I've worked with I've worked with it for so long. It, it it's just an irrefutable fact that it is right on. It it works, but it takes a while to get to a place where you have that kind of certainty and aren't self questioning. I think some people, young astrologers, sometimes they're like, "Well, is this maybe this isn't really, you know, for me? I don't know if this works. It's against my religion or whatever." Mm -hmm. You work with it long enough, it's just become second nature to uh, approaching people in the world. I find it interesting that you mention certainty when it comes to the approach people take with astrology. But how would you describe the artistry behind it all? It's like, um, geez, it's an art in the sense that to be a good astrologer you have to be intelligent on one hand because you're delving into the human psyche uh at least the kind of astrology i work with so you have to develop a lexicon of ways of communicating to a person about his or her uh life their, how their psyche is organized and so I, that's one element of it. But then another is uh, the ability to, like an artist takes something and builds or mixes things. And astrology, uh, again, to be a good astrologer, the ability to synthesize and mix elements to create a statement or, you know, information in a consultation is to me another art and um it's this pulling from different realms of the human experience and alchemizing them to uh create something coherent for the person you know you're you're that's consulting with you and um that's a key word is coherence like, if you listen to young astrologers, it's just this mishmash of what if I was somebody that went to see someone like that, I'd be totally confused about astrology and think it was a joke. You know, just someone going, wow, your moon's in Aries. So, you know, you've got all that, that fire and you're going, but then there's Scorpio on the mid, you know, just uh, all the jargon and, and, uh, 
uh, keywords and it's, it doesn't communicate anything to the person that is there, hopefully, you know, to get information that can assist them in some way. So what is your perspective of astrology as opposed to the modern day view of it where it's kind of all fluff in many ways? You'll see hundreds of blog posts and videos of people just rambling on about astrology and none of it really makes any sense so is there is that your more experience of a, is, like when you've watched those yeah, videos yeah. like what happens yeah. when you watch those it just seems to be quite frank it seems like bullshit because mm-hmm. it's like none mm-hmm. of it makes it makes any sense and they're kind of just referencing all this terminology right. and i'm like i don't know what a house is in this context or an ascendant and i'm like people want to hear things in practical terms in such a way that they can relate it to what is actually going on in their lives. So you have the 45 years of experience. So what is your perspective on how astrology should be presented to the general public or well, to your Well, just quickly, there's a person would have to be educated and, and there would have to be some kind of credentials, even if it's just, wow, I've been doing this 20 years, so I've got some stuff under the belt. Because there's really not, well, except like in England, there's places like that. And in Europe, where there are actually colleges where you can get a degree. And that is actually something that would be ideal. But, I, you know, that's all over the place as far as that uh, being viable nowadays. Right. Um, I, I, I would just say that I, the the... A uh, moment that a client comes to me immediately evokes an archetype of like an oracle and seeker experience. And it's something that really has to be honored with a certain level of, you know, integrity mm-hmm. and um, uh, clarity. And, and this is what I see missing amidst, amidst all of the hubbub within the astrological world nowadays. It, it, you just have amateurs offering, you know, thin gruel to people that actually, if I was coming into astrology now as an interested teen, I would have bailed because it, it's so <laughs> well it's so much of it's embarrassing and i'm not saying obviously there's fantastic astrologers out there it's just they don't maybe have the skill to get search engine optimization going and you know videos every week on youtube and tweeting every 10 minutes you know it's like people have a life to live especially if you're a, a good astrologer you're still learning and you're you're busy so you're saying that it's a bunch of bad apples kind i of. think well yeah and like i don't like to sound like you know the angry grandpa or something <laughs> but i do i i really i'm constantly pushing back on this like in my new book uh skywriter i talk a lot about you know how to improve things what why things are so off the mark Mm -hmm. Um, and suggestions, you know, for people, which a lot of times is just, please stop what you're doing, you know, like go go back to vocational training (laughs) or a gas station attendant. I don't know. You have a reputation in the astrological community as being a harsh critic of the internet. What (laughs) bothers you about the internet exactly? Well, I think we've talked about that here, like... Uh, actually, I think I can generalize this more and say for any artist that is serious about her craft, the internet has made it almost impossible to have her quality work, and this is assuming she's a good artist, have her quality work have and find an audience. A good example is uh, when I first put my book, um, Skywriter, onto Amazon, I realized I was awash of like literally thousands of titles being self-published every day or every week on Amazon. So 
you know, do the math. You can imagine to get traction or get eyeballs, you're suddenly, you know, I, and so eventually I just pulled my work off Amazon and I, I just mark it right off my site and do way better and keep way more money that way. So, mm -hmm. you know, the barbarians have busted through the gate <laughs> with, with the internet and there's stuff I love about the net. I, I have my good fortune to thank to the internet because before I was doing astrology there, I was running uh, other kinds of websites that made me like thousands of dollars um, regularly. So, I, you know, I have no complaints that way, but for the integrity of astrology, yeah, and art, yeah. And I hate it when people go, well, you've just got to learn how to, you know, you've got to learn social media. You've got to do these videos. You've got to get an email list. You've got, and it's like, fuck, what? Like, I, isn't it enough for me to write the goddamn book? Or yeah, it's it's just a complete tsunami of that. I used to uh, do some work with digital marketing and SEO, and you'll see left and right uh, on places like Facebook and Instagram improve your turnover your click rate and it's just like constant non-stop of people barraging you with like re requests to like improve your seo to have well, more people buy your product and it just who can blame them though that's the terms <laughs> now right i mean it is it's, yeah i mean so what did you see for people because this would be nice to offer something other than a big bitch session about it like what do you think well no what what would be positive feedback or advice to somebody that is trying to you know get their work out there or you know what what would you tell them being in that position you were in i think the best advice i could give would be to involve yourself in the community and i've seen plenty of people do this where they are experts in their field but they will go and talk to different communities on the internet or in person, whether it be conferences, for example, and they will engage with everybody. They're not just sending out emails or sending out videos on YouTube. They're actually on the ground floor interacting with the community, asking, answering questions, giving their input, and it, it, it's more valuable to do that than it is to just push rubbish down people's throats day in and yes, day out. Yes, because you know on the push of a button, someone could send can send out 400,000 emails to people, right? I mean, exactly. that whole... You know, this is a good, uh, I think, advice or a good uh, scenario to present to people what you were just sharing about human contact you know, going to conventions, going to get togethers, whatever. Um, my friend BJ Mendelssohn wrote this book a couple years ago that I tell everybody to get that is struggling with this conundrum. It's called uh, Social Media is Bullshit. <laughs> Have, did you ever read that book? I've never heard of it, but it sounds like a practical title. Oh, it's so, it's small. It, I love it. It's like this tiny book by size, and it, you can read it in like a day and a half. And he, this is the kind of stuff he tells people. Go out, get with other people, go to meetings, run ads in newspapers, because mm -hmm. now that area has been abandoned. And it's, you know, anyway, he has great ideas in this book to help people, you know, forge uh, a way forward in this crazy time we're in, because it's only accelerating as far as, um, you know, technological impact on our life. So anyway, yeah, BJ Mendelssohn, social media is bullshit. Grab it today. <laughs> so... I want to turn our attention now to the deep portion of astrology. And <laughs> this is where to... we look at your chart. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll probably touch upon that here and there throughout the conversation. Uh, but I think people are probably really curious to get your perspective or your breakdown of 
what astrology really is and what it does for people pushing aside what they see on the internet right now. Well, mm, say, say that question again. How would you describe astrology to the general person and what would you say its application is what is the purpose of astrology oh okay that's a good question and you know you any astrologer you talk to is going to have their own personal take on that right mm -hmm. i mean it's not like going to a heart surgeon going what's the you know getting heart surgery what is the purpose of, <laughs> you know so I'm just going to say life is a giant mystery, regardless of what religion tells us, philosophy tells us, science tells us, your mother tells you. And astrology can actually offer insights into the human condition but you must learn the art yourself. I would add that as the stinger at the end. What do you mean when you say it gives insight into the human condition? Well, people forget that, okay, they're alive for maybe 90 years and they forget their position within this humongous arc of time that we are born into, understanding that arc of time, which astrology really does, because it, look it looks at epic cycles through, you know, centuries, you can somehow get a sense of your place within this sort of daunting sense of, you know, reality or the universe that you actually have a function and significance within this magnitude. And I think this is what people search for, like in religion or philosophy, is like, what is the meaning? And having been someone that did years and years and was in a spiritual school for like 25 years, you know, meditating, contemplating, doing inquiry, it, it, nothing brought it home like the visceral connection you get with something like astrology, that you are part and parcel this giant or, you know, cosmic system. And it, it, it answers that question of meaning, maybe not in a literal way, like, well, the meaning of life is you know, blah, blah, because there's always some blowhard telling people, you know, you should have compassion, <laughs> you should do this. The, you know. But it, 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 the inquiry that you're in through these astrological matrix can actually inform that question in, in, in meaty ways that are kind of non-conceptual even. It's just something in your bones that you feel. So that was a lie because I just said I was going to do a real short answer and I went on for a half hour. But do you get what I'm saying about that? That wouldn't you say, uh, like, when you look at your life, don't you have private moments where you're really hunkering into the question, like, well, what does it mean? I'm sure everyone out there, including myself, has those moments where we ask ourselves, what is the meaning of life? Mm -hmm. And it's a it's a constant existential question that's probably been posed as far back as one can imagine. It's it's not yes. something that just, it's a it's not just a common occurrence of recent days. It's been quite a question that's been posed throughout history. And I mean, of course, I, I think about it all the time. What is my purpose on here? Do I have meaning? And I think Neil deGrasse Tyson actually made like an interesting point on this and i don't recall exactly what it was but he kind of just alluded to the idea that we are essentially created from the universe our atoms derived from 
the part of destroyed stars yes. and in essence we have more meaning than we believe ourselves to have yeah joni mitchell said it best in her song woodstock she said we are stardust and that's true so instead of people believing that we are irrelevant in this great universe and that we don't have meaning we are in a sense one with the universe and that we do evoke waves or meaning throughout the universe from every throughout every action okay so this is a great example when i think about your horoscope which you know i uh, set up a week ago before you know we were going to do this and your moon is in virgo in your horoscope. what does that mean just <laughs> before so, we well, move I'm, ahead i'm trying <laughs> to make a point here because just the way that you answered this question about meaning you didn't go to religion you didn't go to something you know your grandmother told you you went to science and this is very much what the moon and virgo approach to sensing and feeling the world is about it wants specific details it wants specific facts it wants qualified uh, information to feel which the moon that's the key word for the moon in astrology is the feeling part of the brain it wants that data to uh, you know, give a sense of being secure and safe and, uh, you know, nourished from the world. So that's the way that you, uh, you know, approach and the way that you feel. Now, mm -hmm. because it happens in the eighth house, just hang in there with me. Just take what I shared with you about your moon now we're going to look at well what area in life which the houses have to do with what area of life is my moon and virgo you know operating in so in the eighth house that has to do with the question i asked meaning esoteric knowledge philosophical uh you know insights anything that has to do with sort of the occult or the mysteries of living as a human being has to do with mm -hmm. the eighth house so you know you had mentioned to me when you were younger you did get into astrology right right that is correct so, so there was a certain period about that yeah, yeah that's in like me as a teenager to my dad's horror you know, that was like, God, unusual, you know, to be uh, in a topic like that. Mm -hmm. So anyway, what we did just now talking about, you know, your moon, eighth house, that is part and parcel what a session would be like, you know, with me at least, you know, as a way of priming the pump and then going, you know, deeper and deeper into the mandala of your chart. Um, I would start to, you know, bring key areas into focus and then through our dialogue, because I don't like just blabbing to somebody. Dialoguing with your questions, you know, priming the pump, you know, the chart starts to you know actually come into focus and when that focus establishes it has nothing to do with me saying you're this or that but when that focus comes in tesher you get this inner gut feeling about wow yeah i mm, i there's meaning here there's uh you know, I'm, I'm part of nature and I'm showing up like this. Mm -hmm. And that to me is like the spiritual uh, side of astrology, the poetic side. And um, people are like poems, just like Camille Paglia says, you really need, you know, art as a way to 
delineate and talk about a poem or a person. You can't just do it with, you know, science or, I mean, you can, the body, 70% water, or the blah, blah, blah. But, you know, this, this more subtle, essential level is what a good astrologer helps somebody uh, feel. And like I say, it's, it's rare to find somebody that can work with a client that way, you know. Mm -hmm. So let me, what, when I was talking about the moon in Virgo, eighth house, like what, what was coming up? What were you thinking or feeling? What was going on? Uh, you see, when you mention the house in Virgo, instantly there was a sense of confusion, to be quite candid. And it's in the sense of wanting to hear things in right. very layman's terms. And See, when... uh, yeah, sorry to cut you off, but this moment's good. Like, if your moon was in Pisces, mm -hmm. and I was doing what I did there, most likely just the poetry of the ideas of houses and moons would have been charming <clears throat> for you. But a moon and Virgo person, they they feel out of the mix when you're using terms or whatever. That, exactly. See? Yep. <laughs> so that is um, unique to your nature, that you have that particular way of interpreting, you know, reality. Because the moon mm -hmm. is so critical in that sense for us. You know, feeling our way through life is the lunar mode. Um, it's it, it's funny you brought up the moon. I've been thinking about this for a while and how much the moon impacts our daily life on Earth from everything relating to the tides of the ocean, mm -hmm. image of time, mm -hmm. human hormone cycles, mm -hmm. and even lunar calendars. And I'm not saying I believe in astrology by any means, but I've always found it to be interesting how there is such a connection between the moon and humans and the earth. So yeah, just well, wait till kind of Jeff Bezos out. gets a giant neon sign put up there for Amazon <laughs> that we'll have to see every night. No, that that is, I mean, the moon and astrology that well, the sun and moon think about it, our entire lives are predicated by those cycles, the year, the month. Mm -hmm. uh, it, 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 this is the thing when people say, well, I don't think astrology is that involved with life. You know, I'm like, well, excuse me, every single part of being a human being and uh, under the jurisdiction of time is dealing with astrology. Mm-hmm. It all everything that all the days of the week are named after planets. How far back does this go, though, in re comparison to religion, for example? It started when I decided to study astrology. <laughs> <I'm> kidding. <laughs> it goes back. Well, any culture is going to have their ha historical. You know, any culture on the planet develops their form of astrology, a form of astrology unique to their culture. For Westerners, it's more Babylonian based and then how that, you know, meshed in with other cultures in the uh, nearby area, Egyptian astrology, uh, Mesopotamian astrology all kind of converged in Greece, which with the Hellenistic astrology. Um, and that really is what Western astrologers, like when I put your chart up and looked at it, it was coming from that deep taproot of the Hellenistic school. Mm -hmm. What does that you mean, know, Hellenistic school of astrology? Well, that's just the term I, I maybe historians and anthropologists use for that time, that period in Greece's history. Mm -hmm. um, but all the terms like saying, well, your, your moon's in cancer and that's, you know, it, dignif it is exalted there. All those kind of ideas uh, about how to look and interpret the chart come 
from that school or, or uh, that school inherited them from somewhere else in the nearby area. Is there a huge difference between the different schools of astrology similar to how there's some nuanced differences between various religions, for example? Yeah, there's huge differences and they're based around the uh, authenticity of the zodiac. Um, and so you have these conflicting schools of astrology. One bases the zodiac on the constellations that, you know, when you look up at the sky at night, you're like, oh, there's Sagittarius, the constellation. Right. Yeah. So they base the zodiac on those literal positions of the constellations in relationship to where the earth is. Tropical astrologers base astrology on the zodiac of the earth and how the earth's ecliptic. Sorry, I'm going to cut this short because I know it sounds like woo woo, um, but <laughs> it's based on the ecliptic, how it's divided mathematically into 12 sections, one for each sign of the zodiac. That is the uh, authentic zodiac. I'm here to inform people. Sorry, sidereal,ist but there is no way that I'm a Gemini, which I would be in the sidereal zodiac, and you would be a well, you'd still be a Cancer because of the degree of your sun. But because of how the constellations have shifted, people are about 28 degrees back in the zodiac on that particular map but what, what does that mean exactly sorry well, what does that mean go, 28 degrees it, back it means the zodiac is a circle which is 360 degrees each sign has 30 see your moon and virgo is probably loving this each sign has 30 degrees so you're born with the sun at 29 degrees of cancer right Right. But in a sidereal zodiac, it would push it back to about one degree cancer. Okay, that makes right? sense. Yep. But I'm a Gemini, according to them, which is absolutely bonkers. <laughs> the thing I try to teach students is this. Do you know what an aura is? I've heard of it, and it's kind of the essence people give off. Like the, I guess people would say it's yes. more of the vibe, the vibe someone gives off. Well, no, that's a good word. The essential sort of um, radiation or emanation of, you know, there's this type of photography that supposedly can take a picture of the emanations coming off your body, right? That is exactly what the zodiac is uh, to the earth. The earth, its aura, you know, emanates out energetically. And that actually is what the zodiac is. Um, I'm just going to leave it there because I hear people going, I'm tuning out of this now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Backing out that he's not talking about my sign. So now I'm going to pull out. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um through, you threw me for a loop there, Frederick. With the Zodiac? Yeah, wow. J um, just think about it like you're like a, the Earth. See, here's the other thing about astrology, Tesher, is people don't get that the, the planets and the sun and the moon are actually like beings. They aren't just gaseous rocks or, or forms floating in space. They're, they are actual living beings with their with, at a level and scale that we can't even imagine operating from mm -hmm. as you know a life system goes. But they are um, in their own evolutionary process, just like the Earth is. And the Earth itself is, you know, you've heard of Gaia mine, where it's really the looking at the livingness of the earth mm -hmm. and that's applies to everything in the solar system is alive so you know when these bodies move around the solar system you can just think of it as like a group of people that are moving into different orientations to one another and 
sometimes when they're in opposition to each other, there's tension that comes out through that uh, vector. Or if they're in a harmonious position to one another, there's more flow. Um, and that's, that's how I teach astrology. I just make it very simple. Planets, sun and moon, they're alive. The earth has an aura as energies move through it, it colors things in a certain way and it makes people crazy on the planet. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but, you know, it, it impacts like the moon, impacts the tides and, you know, so it's sunspots, touch off different earth cycles and it's all interconnected. So what I'm gathering here is that astrology, or at least what astrology is, is the representation of a person's personality based off a symbolic configuration of the planets and an individual's subconscious um, vibrations or aura. Yeah, now you're sounding like one of those YouTube astrologers. Yeah, I'm just like, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to wrap my head around no, this. No, <laughs> you're, you're on to something there. It's not symbolic positions the planets are in literal geometric positions to one another in the solar system at any given time so that's astronomical fact and that yes those positions those planets or the sun and the moon when those get included mm -hmm. those how they're arranged in juxtaposition to when and where the person was born does have a certain pattern or matrix that the person is living his or her life through. And I don't mean that in a fatalistic way, but more in an eco, psychic ecosystem way. The biosphere, as you could almost call that, like the emotional body of the earth, you know, different movements energetically happen within that field, and it 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 impacts people. Mm -hmm. See, the 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 basic nut about astrology is when something is born. You know, you come out of your mother. You've been in this womb world for nine months, dependent on her system to regulate, feed, etc suddenly you're popped out and then you're a true autonomous entity and that moment that you enter the biosphere of the earth that is like you know that's sort of the imprint that moment is charged with um and then that it's what astrologers, you know, study when they look at a birth horoscope. You know, where was the moon? Where was Mars? Um, Etc. One thing I've noticed, though, that I guess the general person wouldn't realize is that the horoscope isn't just your sun sign. Correct me if I'm wrong with that, but it's kind of like a layer of an onion where you have sub signs within your major sign yeah uh, right yeah you could say you have a moon sign sun sign venus sign mars sign yes um and what you're getting at is you know when people go oh i'm a capricorn well yes your sun was in capricorn when you were born or actually the earth was in cancer when you were born so it looks like the sun was in capricorn but don't get me going down that <laughs> hole. so yeah you're i'm a capricorn but i have moon and you know scorpio and venus is in gemini and you know so yes the sun sign is the popular way that people mark themselves astrologically you know, because it's so easy, everybody born between, you know, June 20 and July 21 are like cancers or mm -hmm. nearby dates like that. So it's easy to have, like you see <clears throat> all the astrology sun sign columns and horoscopes talking about Virgos doing this and blah, blah. 
Um, but yeah, the richness of the chart comes out when each of the other planets and the moon are pulled in to the equation. Mm -hmm. Though the sun is really the center point, just like it is in our solar system. I mean, it makes everything happen. And that's right. the case for people too. That luminosity of the sun, the magnitude of it, is always the key drive within the person's uh, psyche or soul or whatever you want to call it. So the sun basically anchors your personality type and everything else is... Well, yeah. I mean, the word personality, I have... There's different ways of using that. I would say the sun has to do with character and mm -hmm. essence. And then personality is often things that don't have anything to do with you it's things you imitate from your parents or huh. when you, you know just traits right. that were acquired they aren't essential if that is what astrology is your characteristics what isn't astrology because i'm gonna throw in an example here you go on okay. the internet and you research your astrological sign and mm -hmm. you read the daily horoscope or weekly and it somehow some way decides to predict what's going to happen to you in the next few days and i'm thinking to myself that's batshit insane so what is 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 that what astrology isn't or is there something else that's a misinterpretation of what astrology well i is? would say what you're describing with the sun sign columns are uh novelties that can pique people's interest in astrology. And that's why I think as corny as they are, it's just like me when I was a kid collecting those tiny books. Mm -hmm. And I, so, you know, yeah, that type of, of pop astrology is not, it's fun, but is that, yeah, that isn't astrology. It can't, it, it can't predict the future, is what I'm saying, essentially, here. I don't think even deep astrology can predict the future. So you, mm -hmm. I think you and I talked about this earlier. I, I don't like the word predictions. Uh, it's associated to predicament. And um, I just find that sends things down the wrong rabbit hole when that comes up. And, of course, it's human nature to want to know the future but right. i've done astrology god it, it, it has a horrible horrible track record when people try to literalize it into saying this is going to happen you know in 2023 or exactly it, yeah. yeah so i totally leave it. when i do work with clients i always am up front with them as i am on my site about, you know, it, you find somebody else if you're looking for that, because you're not going to have it with me. And that's something you mentioned to me, actually, about the fact that you dislike the word readings when you're doing sessions mm. or consultations mm -hmm. with people. Can you kind mm -hmm. of touch upon that more of what bothers you about well, that Well, it's just the connotation that the, of the word, not the word itself. I mean, readings... Um, evoke like gypsies and someone wearing a turban or something <laughs> and uh, two I, I don't do monologues with people and a lot of times uh people are like okay i've given you a hundred dollars now tell me about myself right mm -hmm. so dialoguing is the key because it when you're, you know, Socratic inquiry is so potent because it allows for something that you haven't considered and I haven't considered to emerge in the exchange between the two of us. And that is really what people are maybe unconsciously seeking when they do a uh, you know, reading or whatever, or a session, you know, is there's some kind of guidance that's actually possible, but you have to be out of your control freakness and I have to be out of my trying to control anything. And then there's something about when you ask me a question, I ask you a question. 
it's like the lights start to come on in ways that aren't uh, readily available in just chit chat or, you know, somebody, the narcissism that occurs in astrology readings is always mind blowing to me that someone would sit there, the client, and listen to somebody babbling for an hour or whatever. It's just daunting to me. And yet, yeah. you know, some people, that's what they think astrology is about is, you know, a lot of times I'll have clients, they'll call, we're talking and there's this sort of picture in my mind of them sitting with their arms crossed over their chest. <laughs> Why do you think that is? Well, they 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 want, they, pro they probably are Virgos or Tauruses, you know, they, they are like, okay, what are you going to dazzle me? Mm -hmm. You know, tell me, you know, what my grandmother's name was or, you know, just this kooky kind of ideas about and it's not their fault. They've just gotten the wrong ideas about what's possible in an astrology session. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, when I worked as a telephone psychic, oh God, back in the 80s, I mean, that it, that was like the boot camp version of astrology. What was where, that like? Well, <laughs> something I'd never wish on my worst enemy. <laughs> I'm kidding. I, I actually wrote a book about that. My first book uh, got me an agent and a publisher because I was in the middle of that gig. And I was like, fuck, this is like so bizarre. I've got to, as a writer, you know, uh, delve into this so and that's that was my first book secrets of a telephone psychic but it it was grueling um and uh it, I, I just read the book i don't know i'm not trying to do sales it's just like to <laughs> capsulize that it was it was hard it was kooky it was scary sometimes people would call up like you know, I think my boyfriend's having sex with my daughter. What do the stars say? And I'd be like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> you know, here's an 800 number. Please call and get help. Well, no, and that, that was the thing about that. I actually got a hold of Camille Poglia to ask her about telephone oracles because those were huge in the 80s. And she was somebody, like I mentioned, that I really admired as a culture critic. And she nailed it. She goes, you know, telephone psychics have become affordable shrinks for people that can't afford $180 sessions with, you know, their psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. And she kind of celebrated them because she loves, like, you know, metaphysics and astrology. But what did you think... But wouldn't you think that is one of the reasons why people dissuade anything to do with astrology or in this case specifically uh, psychics? It's because there is this push to have it overrun everything people do. So, for example, it's far more common or far more easy to get your astrology sign mm -hmm. handed to you or mm -hmm. your psychic reading done than it was in the past people could just call a number or type in a website totally and there they have it so totally. it kind of it saturates society and then people think to themselves well this is this can't be real well it's the little bit of that but there's more experiences of grift and con artistry that mm. amplifies so that taints the reputation of I don't can't speak about psychics that much, but I know astrologers because that's how I worked. I wasn't a psychic, though they call it that. I was doing astrology and also tarot. But yeah, this is my big gripe, as I was saying earlier about uh, what astrologers have inherited with the internet is this constant erosion of uh, integrity and astrology's reputation and it's always had a murky reputation anyway because it it it's something you know as soon as something 
leans towards taboo in the culture, it immediately falls into what I call the shadow realm of human exchange. And when you're in the shadow realm, you're up for, you know, sky's the limit as far as con artistry. Well, I mean, it's how Trump got elected. You know, it's like the culture was so deep into the shadow side of life that something like the Trump phenomenon could actually be seen as a viable, you know, way for a country to have itself governed. The Trump phenomenon? Could you elaborate Donald on Trump. that? Donald Trump. Well, I mean, <laughs> oh my God. I'm, I'm really I, curious here. <laughs> I, well, Trump is like... I, Oh, God. From the bigger picture, which would be the astrological one, as soon as Pluto went into Capricorn, I know this sounds like someone babbling out by the bus stop, but the moment that uh, Pluto went into Capricorn in 2008, the entire country moved into what I call this shadow zone. And in psychology, this comes from Jungian psychology, the shadow zone is any part of reality that you or I or anyone else doesn't want to see or acknowledge. So, you know, I'm going through my life doing this and that, and there's all this stuff I'm avoiding. I don't see it. I don't see how I'm a racist. I don't see how I'm a homophobe. I don't you know, see the disparity between rich and poor, you know, all these unsavory qualities of being a human being came into the forefront when that ingress happened of Pluto going into Capricorn. So as that, you know, got momentum, because Pluto's in there for decades, it, you know, fomented uh, the type of condition within the culture that a game show host could suddenly become the precedent. Even, you know, he was accused of, you know, sex crimes and this and that and grift and, you know, and come on down, take rulership most powerful person on the planet so yeah so for me as an astrologer i i see all this and i'm like wow yeah it makes perfect sense you know that that the trump phenomenon would be happening as a wake-up call for people to come to terms with racism wealth disparity you know all this stuff you know that we're seeing ping-ponging around every day on mm -hmm. Twitter and the newspapers, you know. Right, and you have a perspective on how astrology is impacting our generation. And you mentioned astrology plays a role in not only the impact of an individual's character, mm -hmm. but as well as on a generational Cultures level. Genera Cultural, and, yeah, exactly. So right. what are your thoughts on the current state of things well i i let me see how to um <laughs> well i want to ask you like how old are you again i am 26 okay wow so as a, a person in their 20s when you look at the culture right now what what is your impression like what how is it for you that's a good question. I mean, what just comes? What comes to mind? I like, was boom. gonna, yeah, um, hedonistic, but oh, at the oh, same yeah. time, there is a strong desire for a move away from that. I think people are trying to live life more simply and more spiritually, but they're coming to grips with fighting between a hedonistic lifestyle mm -hmm. because of 
how they compare themselves to others on social media. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But at the same time, they know that isn't necessarily the best way to live. So there's this huge conflict, internal conflict within our society between those two okay. groups. Okay, yeah. Don't you think the conflict is exacerbated by the fact that we have to use, many people have to use the internet and the tech scene and all that to try to make a living? I mean, it, it, it isn't that like a catch-22 for, I mean, unless you just fall off the grid and you're, you know, using the postal system and a rotary dial phone and not, I, I just, I, I'm, I'm not arguing, I'm just sort of stepping deeper in, into what you were saying because I'm, I've never heard someone your age call it hedonistic, I think, and I'm not disagreeing. I, I mean, I, I am, I don't do astrology into politics and I, I try to leave all that out because I have clients that are Trump, you know, supporters. And, mm -hmm. But don't you look at a person like Trump, I'm sorry to pick on him, <laughs> but it's just so in our face. I mean, you, you, you experience Trump, I, it is hedonistic in a way. I mean, so that is an actually, that is actually a fitting term. And the other aspect you bring up as a response to that is the very thing I've been writing about. I just haven't put it out there yet because people are like, well, how should I live? Where should I move? What? And not that I think I have the answers to that, but just like you use this idea of, you know, stepping out of it all into a more contemplative or spiritual life and setting up cult a culture within that. And that's what I talk about when I say to people, well, I think we're approaching something like a monastic expression coming up within culture where people, it's too crazy, too hedonistic, too debauched. And, and I don't say that as a moral judge. I just like those sound, the onomatopoeia of those words. And then so people step out of that and do what's always happened in a dark age with, say, monastic living. The arts are preserved. The poetry is preserved. All, all of those fine uh, expressions of being a human being are preserved. And I really and truly think that is where we are heading. And I like to focus on that rather than, you know, a Cassandra uh, vision of screaming negativity. Because, you know, you hear that constantly about right. how shit, shitty things are. Mm -hmm. Unless you're, you know, Bloomberg or Jeff Bezos or whatever. So, <laughs> you know, I think that's interesting. And this, do you, and you see this with your peers, this sort of stepping out or a desire to, like unplug of course it's it's extremely common to see that i mean of course people are hedonistic and i think that is a byproduct of technology and for why example, so like what what is technology unleash in that so for example simply put cell phones for example have connected us so deeply but have has isolated us to a greater degree. So instead of meeting with people and hanging out with everybody, people are on their phones and posting to social media. They post to Instagram and Snapchat about how great their outward images or how their outward life yes. is, but their life yes. isn't a reflection of that. So I think technology is driving this wedge between what people are and what they really want to be. And I think it's it's an ebb and flow. Of course, I think it's like, in a sense, a level of a dark age in society. But I do think there is a 
a sense of optimism because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, people will default to their biological imperatives and they will find deeper connection and deeper meaning through spending time with their friends and their family and doing things that are meaningful to them. I think a lot of what we're dealing with now is a lot of societal pressure and a lot of that come, derives from technology, from consumer marketing, the list yeah, goes on. And this ability that that brings to someone or a group of people to compare, like you say, that's a key point, I think, compare mm -hmm. their lives to somebody else's life and then create a fake. See, that's the thing that makes me crazy, the fakeness. And then I think this also explains why astrology is popular with millennials just and beyond just sun sign stuff, because it does move towards authenticity or, or some wanting something to be, you know, find out what's more real. Uh, and I think that's part of astrology's appeal right now in this new renaissance. But see, like if you were on and I were in a session right now with each other, with your chart in between us, I, I, I would say to you, um, wow, I see how key elements of what you just expressed as your view of what's happening are exactly mirrored in your birth chart. Like, just a quick example, we talked about like the moon and Virgo and where it was positioned that, you know, more otherworldly interests about life, but kind of in a scientific way, you know, wanting facts rather than, you know, fantasy. So that combined with your cancer, your sun sign, which has a lot to do with the sacredness about human connecting and relating and, and the, the kind of power uh, that's within love, you know, with, when people have an affinity. And then how your son and cancer is tied into your generational markers of a, uh, Neptune, Uranus, conjunction in Capricorn and we talked about this the other day how those generational planets show you were born within a wave of people that are in their 20s now that revolution is coming through spiritual modalities like this this is where uh you know the intimations you were making about people going off grid something you know more spiritual or blah 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 that that's actually like an impulse waiting within you to emerge more and offer to the culture that you're in right now you know mm -hmm. so that's interesting so just the stuff we talked about as an astrologer I, it's right there, clear as day in your chart. But if I had tried to say this to you and went down the wrong path with certain symbols or whatever, it, it, it could have been dissonant. But because of inquiry, us talking back and forth, see, it all sort of emerged into this third energy this middle ground between us you know it you know emerged on its own and that what i just shared with you might you know be something important to you on your life path should you you know connect with those ideas mm -hmm. about you being involved with something like a monastic movement or a, you know how spirituality can revolutionize things or initiate change in a meaningful way um so I, that's great we just kind of did that without specifically setting out to do it <laughs> with your chart you know exactly but how does one rationalize in theory let's just theoretically say that people believed in astrology 
Okay. How would how would they rationalize astrology with the ideas of science and religion and every other form of thought? Because they all have their place in society, and a lot of it's faith based. A lot of it is scientifically founded. But I think something that should be noted is that there's a lot of confirmation bias associated with kind of the pseudoscience, the occult, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any, anything that's eccentric and mm -hmm. spiritual. There is a lot of pseudoscience and confirmation mm -hmm. bias. People want to hear what makes them comfortable, what relates to them. So how do, the, how do people rationalize believing in something like astrology? Well, I always say to people, you know, I don't believe in a screwdriver before taking out like a or screwing in a screw or do you know what I mean? I don't believe in a wrench <laughs> before using it to take a bolt off or something. So I think that's a nutshell <laughs> answer, but I think in a deeper Response a, a deeper response would be to say whatever middle ground can exist between science and spirituality, something like astrology would be a perfect candidate for that kind of inquiry to happen within. And I do know more and more uh, about people doing just that. I just don't have interest in it because you know, you only have so much time in a day to get into something. Mm -hmm. um, it, yeah, so I think that's the best answer I can come up with there, other than going off on a tangent about uh, being bored <laughs> with rationalists and, you know, people like, prove this to me. Before I, you know, I'm just like, oh, God, go watch the X-Files. <laughs> if someone came to you and asked you to summarize astrology to them not to prove to them it is factual or not factual but to truly understand in a very simplistic point of view what would you tell that person in oh, right. 60 seconds or less <laughs> oh my god well the first thing i do to cheat with your 60 seconds <laughs> Just give them that quote by Camille Paglia that I read earlier about rationalists staying out of the realm of astrology because it's an art and blah, blah. So that I would give them a little slip of paper with that on there. And then I would say, um, I would just be a bitch about it and just say, look, I can recommend some really good books for you to check out, but there's no, I mean, I, there's just no nutshell way to answer that. Uh, I, Cause it automatically evokes having to br bring belief in or some kind so, of faith or magic. So there is thinking. faith and belief in astrology. It's not for like... that person that might uh -huh. have, like when I was a kid and started, I had to make a leap of faith to even put time into astrology to mm -hmm. eventually discover, wow, you know, this is happening. So, yeah, I... I what, about, I, what about what astrology tells somebody in layman's terms? It all depends on the astrology. Like a mundane astrologer looks at governments and cultures. A judicial astrology looks at uh, law cases and attorneys and uh you know figuring out moments for when th to do things uh, i don't know why i said attorneys anyway um you know character astrology like the work i do with people uh mm -hmm. psychological understanding you could have uh there's astrologers that focus just on the weather and predicting weather pad like old moore's almanac that comes out every year they have this team of astrologers that eerily predict like weather patterns like you know years in advance no that so, is crazy <laughs> i know it's really wild i so yeah it just depends on what school of astrology you know there's horary astrology where you 
ask a question like where are my car keys and you immediately do a horoscope for the moment of that question and lo and behold you can find your car keys by following you know the elements within the chart that symbolize this or that um so yeah it just de depends on the school of astrology that someone's working with before we kind of close things off because i do have a list of a couple of final questions to okay. ask you. I know we talked a lot about your writing and your work within that area. What kind of tips would you offer to other writers oh. that might be listening? I would suggest that anyone writing fiction or nonfiction, I would say to him or her, how much do you like being alone? Because there's a lot of fucking solitude when you're a writer. It, it just, it's just really, you know, with all the arts, writing is the loneliest. Um, and then, oh, this is terrible what I'm going to say. <laughs> uh, I would say don't pay money to go to school. <laughs> to become a writer unless you're going there like to learn grammar and spelling tips <laughs> because I, I just feel like people can either write or they can't write. It's like a, a skill like a musician has where it's sort of there's an inherent ear in place for music and really writing is 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 about like sculpting words in a musical way. So, I mean, I never knew grammar or spelling in school, but I could always hear rhythms and harmony and syntax. And, and that just can't be taught. I just, I know that's horrible for MA programs everywhere, but <laughs> no, I think that, money, I think that's a great point you make. I really have a couple, I have a couple of thoughts on that because Oh, what? For one, yeah, for one, I had Dan Schilling, who is a well-known combat controller in the Special Forces. I had him on the show a oh, while ago. Oh, I saw ago. that. Yes. Yeah, and, he, and yeah. He, at the very yeah, at the very end, he was kind of talking about how if you want to be a good writer, all you have to do is just continuously write and practice. That's all it takes. It's just about writing more and more. And then, secondly, one of the interesting things about the arts is that. If you want to learn how to read, you just need to learn how to see. If you want to learn how to write, you need to learn how to hear. Oh, I, he said that. He didn't say that. It's oh, just a kind of it's, it's a general. Mm. Uh, it's a. I think I've heard the quote somewhere, but people tend to kind of bring that up in the sense of, if you want to learn how to cook, learn how to taste, and it just kind of enhancing your senses to be able to be more in tune with the art itself. Well, right. And in and, and the same vector about solitude, I was talking about the half of that solitude is your writing time. And then the other big chunk is reading and reading and reading and reading. And I mean, if you could see my house, it's like walking into like the you know a library in new york or something because i i just read continually and this is another thing that bothers me about the internet <laughs> sorry but it's like suddenly people have fallen into this bizarre like passive state of just streaming netflix and listening to audiobooks and ugh. like there's when you read, like when you read, isn't your imagination engaged? Yeah, yeah. I would say more so than when I listen to an audiobook because right. an audiobook is more passive. Exactly. That's the word, this passivity that has overcome the entire, well, not entire. I tend to be melodramatic. I have a Leo rising. But the it takes up, you know, this... Uh, What's the word? It's like a um, collapsing in to just. Did you ever see that movie 
what was that film where there was a robot that was it was an animated robot was left down on this planet of junk and wally wally yeah remember how that starts in wally and there's just those like overly large yeah people yeah yeah with slurpees <laughs> like and just laying in chairs like and i'm like oh god is this like a prophetic like vision or imagine something? if that was the case 10 years I mean, from now or 20 i don't this. know dude so anyway but i'll just say about my writing should anybody be interested in the specifics i i do have those two books available on my site uh, secrets of a telephone psychic and then my new book on astrology, Skywriter. And then I'm working on a fiction book right now, which is a real interesting stretch for me because I've never written fiction before. And then after 25 years in a spiritual school, this other book I'm writing now called uh, The Mind Fuck is going to look at our whole culture's obsession with, uh, you know, how-to experts and Tony Robbins and uh, people, you know, telling other people how they should live, what they need to do. Like, it's again this strange passive mode that um, I just wonder where gumption has gone to Mm -hmm. for people, you know. I mean, what was it for you to start your podcast? That's gumption to have an aspiration get you know what what would you tell people that want to start a podcast wow wow putting me on the spot here well um, <laughs> it's, a, it's still a creative it's a, it's a good venture. question um i think wanting to start a podcast really derived from enjoying talking to people and learning about what they do. I'm always interested in learning about others and hearing their story and their perspectives in a hopefully objective manner. So I think that is really what sparked it. And then just being involved with a community in some form. And then from there, it's just one day you just tell yourself, put one foot in front of the other one step at a time, then you kind of just put it together from there. And I think that's really what stops a lot of people from pursuing the things that they want to do. It's that they look at it as this giant monolith of a challenge and it terrifies them. And I think for anybody that really wants to pursue something, just break it into small pieces and tackle it one step at a time. So oh my I, god, I, yeah, a true I, moon and Virgo giving the keys. I mean, that's great. Yeah, yeah. You know, There's a quote by Steve Maraboli, which goes something like, Take action. An inch of movement will bring you closer to your goals than a mile oh, of yeah. intention. And that's the problem with creative projects is they start, of course, with an idea. Mm-hmm. And, and then it's good to nurture that with imagination and and yet there comes this tipping point where you have to go i can only speak for myself so i had to go okay enough imagining fantasizing get off your ass <laughs> and just like do you say it. what yeah and but that's the thing that eludes people that you gotta stay up i had to stay aware and look for that tipping point because if if i didn't follow that i'd still be like thinking about this fiction book like oh i'm gonna do this and this has got to happen oh my god that and blah, blah. and you know finally got up set a schedule started writing going there every day writing for two hours writing you know and 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 then it was on its way and then it has its own momentum wouldn't you say that with the you know, your podcast. Oh, fully agree. I mean, look how we met because I heard you. Listen, I am like one of those people. I wake up at 3 a.m. Like I'm ready to get 
the, the day going. I, I'm cursed by this. And so I wake up at three and I'll go back to sleep like in an hour. And I started listening to podcasts in that time period. And what I love about your cast is it it doesn't it it it's sort of made for nocturnal people because I just love the conversational flow. There's not crazy sound effects and you know uh, flashing around with stuff and noise and jarring. And I I just I just have to. Uh, congratulate you on having that be your style because you know a lot of people get out there do a podcast and it's their chance to be a dj and bring in you know this mix and that and blah. so i love that about your podcast but um it's rare to find those within on spotify which i use you know mm-hmm. they they tend to be so noisy yeah i can imagine and again i, I appreciate the the compliment yeah, it's, well, it's just finding, sure. it's just creating something that people want to get down to brass tacks with. They just want to hear content. So that's that's really what it is. So, I yeah, I hope everyone enjoys the episode. But, you know, everyone has their different idea well, of what a podcast is. And... Well, sure. But, I mean, what do you, what's under someone's wanting to hear conversation? Don't you think it's like people are, it's a form of contact with other human beings you know through the ears right yeah i mean that's really all it is i mean it's just a form of connection but i think with that's someone. why i mean it's a it's mega now it's you know a couple of years ago shit i didn't know what podcasts like what you know and then suddenly it, it i think it's really a remedy for a lot of the other stuff that the internet has you know brought online Mm-hmm. and uh, back to it's a gesture towards human connecting and warmth and yeah, uh, yeah. contact you know it's sure. i think i think it's kind of just the evolution of radio and talk shows it's just the next thing it, it makes it a lot easier for people to be on the go and still be able to tune into things they enjoy listening to that's really what so so what can your listeners do to assist in your uh growth and evolution with the cat podcast like what what do you suggest to people and you know that want to do that yeah that's easy i mean at the end of the day the podcast is or yeah all things interesting podcast is just really made for the community out there it's for what they want to hear what they want to listen to so it's providing or suggesting people that they want to hear on the show uh, and learn more about. And that's really all it is. It's to share the knowledge mm-hmm. of things that people mm-hmm. might not already know about to talk with individuals that may not be as well known as individuals that they see on the TV or the internet every single day. Oh yeah, celebrity. You're not gonna have any of the Kardashians on. I, take it. <laughs> I have no intention to, but you know, <laughs> um, at the end of the day, this podcast is like an open soundboard. So if they ever want to come on the show, by all means, we'll chat it up about <laughs> well, I'll hook whatever you up with TMZ. I don't know. <laughs> That's great. I love it. Um, but before we kind of close things off today, mm-hmm. I'd like to end things with a couple of quick hitter questions Mm, and mm. you can just answer these to the best of your ability or how you best see fit so okay i'm just gonna shoot these at you uh there's six questions and we'll just run through them oh i'll keep it short then to the answers (laughs) so first question is what is something you feel people can take away from astrology even if it's not something they personally believe in? Uh, I I would say that it offers a viable opportunity. Well, no, it offers a a viable condition that might assist them in understanding the meaning of life. That's, yeah, I'm going to leave it at that. If someone, sort of. <laughs> go, go ahead. ahead go ahead. That's it. Nothing. 
if someone wanted to pursue a career in astrology, what advice would you give them? Um, oh, God. I, I uh, would have them contact me. I'm not being facetious. I really, <laughs> well, no, because right now one of the projects I'm working on is a short uh, PDF, you know, like 12 pages of uh, suggested, you know, material to, to just read, get a hold of, consider. So, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be self promoting in that Tony Robbins kind of way. <laughs> say, <laughs> so they can get me, you know, through astroinquiry.com. Yeah. And I mean, I'll, I'll leave a link sure. to your website and yeah, what's any the other contact? Keep going with the questions. I'm hot. Yeah. Yeah. Now. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, what is the biggest misconception about astrology that you would want to clear up? Oh, uh, that the internet offers possibly the worst exposure and experience to astrology within its long history uh, uh, on the planet. Hmm. <laughs> Is that, does that help? Yeah. Clear it? Okay, great. I, I sounded as like I the... said, you have to answer it as best as you see fit <laughs> okay. in any way you want. So I don't know if it was human language work. that answered, but go ahead. <laughs> What is your greatest takeaway from astrology, whether it be something that you learned about yourself mm. or people as a whole? Wow. Uh, I, this is, this is, mm. it, astrology, when I was a young kid, astrology actually helped me come to terms with being gay. I, I can't really... It's not like there's, and please, disclaimer, there's no markers in the chart that says this person's gay, bi, whatever. But it, I'll just leave it at that. There were certain proclivities and whatnot indicated in the chart that I was like, oh, well, that, yeah, that jibes with being attracted to guys. I'll just leave it at that. If you were to share one message with the listeners on this show oh my god what would it be <laughs> turn your life over to jesus no i'm kidding <laughs> um <laughs> i'm sorry say the question again i didn't mean to be if, if you were to share one message with the listeners on the show what would it be oh my lord i would say uh do not lose heart uh amidst the times that we are living in there are are rhymes and reasons to what is happening and astrology a deeper understanding of it might help the person make more sense of what is unfolding hmm. i like i think that. there's a lot of kind of despair out there on some well some groups of people so yeah i would just add that that's very well said and then the last question Okay. What would you most like to tell people that no one ever asks about? <laughs> I don't know. Say the question one more time fast. Say it fast. Yeah. What would you most like to tell people that no one ever asks you about? Um, that ultimately, <laughs> that ultimately... Each of us is our own guru, guide, or teacher. And to get to that place of trusting in one's own inner guidance isn't something that comes from just thinking about it or reading about it. There has to be a long period of exploration and seeking beforehand but I, I I'm dismayed with our fascination nowadays with gurus and experts and know-it-alls and people they don't even they just don't think much anymore it's like oh what did MSNBC say about blah blah well fuck what do you think about it you know I, I so that's it I'll leave it at that <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, Frederick, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's very well said. Um, Great. Good. Yeah. 
So, Wanted to leave you with a real egg. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Tesher, it was great. Thanks so much for uh, setting up the connection. And I really enjoyed this uh, time with you. Yep, it's, it's really been... Really enjoyed the flow. Yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show, Frederick. And I appreciate you taking the time to sit down and share your thought on astrology and society as a whole. So sure. again, thank you so much. All right. Take care. Hope you all enjoyed this episode of the All Things Interesting podcast with my guest, Frederick Woodruff, on the topic of astrology. And when I was doing research for the show, I came across a quote by a very famous psychiatrist and psychoanalyst by the name of Carl Jung. Astrology, like the collective unconsciousness with which psychology is concerned, consists of symbolic configurations. The planets are the gods, symbols of the power of the unconsciousness. And I found it to be a very deliberate approach to what astrology is. I will also be dropping a couple links to Frederick Woodruff's website, as well as his books and some other links that I find interesting, which you can find on the episode page at my website, teshercohen.com. Please make sure to subscribe and follow on your favorite podcast platform, whether it be iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, you name it, the show is most likely there. Also, feel free to follow me on Twitter at Tesher Cohen and on Instagram at All Things Interesting Podcast. Lastly, for those of you who enjoyed the music of the show, I want to give a huge shout out to my good friend, Stu Lucio, who has been producing the music since the beginning. You can find him on Spotify at Stu Paul. Thanks again, and stay tuned for new episodes of the All Things Interesting Podcast.